crescendo of Egyptian geese noise as they're chasing each other around, so the weavers are going to have to just wait a little bit. It is absolute chaos with the Egyptian geese this morning. There's just noise coming from every direction. You can see even the ones on top of the nests are very upset with each other. There we go. Chase that one away. Off you go. This is our nest. And you can see the bright blue, white wings as well. Oh, hopefully it'll all calm down a little bit. It's a bit of a hectic start, to be honest. There's lots of action going on. There's a few hippos having a bit of a game as well underneath the Egyptian geese. And the Egyptian geese are riling everybody up and getting everyone rather excited this morning. There was even a crocodile that made an appearance that has now disappeared as well. But back to our weavers. You can see our weavers are still going at it, building as fast as they can. and a little further than others. Others are still lagging quite far behind. I would have anticipating now and are packing the nest with nice soft material. Apologies, we appear to have lost Tristan and it was just as our lion put his head back down. Hey mister, you're just not in the mo mood to show your pretty face to all of us. So that collar, you can see the battery pack there, that's where all of the important stuff lives. And that collar will be transmitting, I'm not sure. Um, and that will usually be updated once or twice a day. It might also transmit a radio signal um, so that this animal can be found using a telemetry set. It basically picks up beeps and the louder the beeps are, the closer the animal. It's quite a fun thing to do to track animals with telemetry. Occasionally a little scary when the beeps get very loud and you're on foot in a thick area. But it does give you a much better idea of exactly where the animal is. I would suggest this is probably GPS only, but I'll find out. I was just thinking of my first ever lion darting where a boy was being relocated to a different reserve in South Africa and he, he was blind in one eye, he had this completely milky blue eye and both the first two darts bounced off the bone and he didn't go down um, but he did lie down, he got groggy for a little bit and the, the vehicle that we were on we drove up to him and he was absolutely incensed, as you can imagine he was, he was frightened and he charged after us and we were racing off road to try and dodge art fark holes and get away from him and I mean he was still wide awake and unbelievably fast. I'll never forget the look on his face. Basically what you do is you have to put them on a stretcher, either a canvas or a plastic stretcher with handholds, and it takes a good few people to pick up a, a male lion. It's a very, very heavy... Uh, but I have really, I've had some really fantastic opportunities. All right, while we're sitting waiting patiently for our lions to see if they're going to get up or if they're going to snooze the morning away, let's go and find out whether Taylor has any darting tales to tell you. There we go. There's a lion. Sorry, I'm just directing Darby. Can you see it, Darby? Just behind the buffalo. So we've come across some lionesses. I suspect that it is our girls from last night that we had near the Mara River. Sorry, Jamie, I will tell you some darting stories, but I'll tell them in a little bit. And we have this girl who I've just spotted, but it wasn't the first one that I've seen. And then over here on the right, we had another one, and she's caught something. I'm trying to figure out what it is. It's obviously quite far away. I think it might have been a... A little warthog. It looks very, very dark in colour, and there are so many warthogs around here at the moment. So it would n naturally, to me, I would I'd suspect that it's probably either a sub-adult or it's going to be a little piglet because there's plenty of them around at the moment. Now, if we've got two, and it is, this, it could be a different pride. I have seen two other lionesses hanging around here, so I'm just scanning and making sure. Look how they're all streaming in on the left. You might be able to see it just walking behind uh, some of the trees. There she is. So she's got a bit of distance between her, and those, that buffalo doesn't seem too bothered. But the rest of the herd, the rest of the herd is actually running towards her now. Look, there's a buffalo. She's not hanging around there. We're very far away. All watching her. Yeah, she's going to be careful. She she's trying to get away from them. They're coming for her now. 
I'm so sorry, Rebecca. Please, can I have that all again? There's too too much excitement going on. Now, Rita, you're wondering if buffalo are the most difficult animals to hunt. Well, I, maybe. You know, I wouldn't know. I've never hunted a buffalo, and I don't think I could do what a lion does and jump onto its back and try and take it down. Uh, for lions, it's definitely a huge, huge threat. They've got to be careful. They are such such powerful creatures and with a nasty attitude well most of the time i mean we've never had a buffalo smile at us a couple of birds around too and so yes i think for a lion most certainly especially big herds are they all coming together now they're not tolerating her she's not interested in them though she's lean she probably once she realizes that her friend up here is actually caught a something a water guy suspect um she'll maybe come back oh they're all around they're charging again look at them they're really putting in an effort i'm so sorry we're so far away but it, it's going to take us ages to get round. they've come running from 100 200 meters away and look at that youngster you better be careful and they're all charging towards her they're still going they're going to they're going to see another vehicle uh they're down on the bottom row we actually passed them earlier and that lion, there comes the lion, she's just on the left-hand side. She's just behind that shrub, but on the right-hand side of the car. She should pop out now. A buffalo really not having any of it. That's so cool. They, oh, no, they might be chasing her. What she could be doing is she's probably putting some vegetation between herself and the buffalo. But the buffalo are still, they'll just mow straight through and over some of those shrubs and trees. But she will be able to get away. I mean, if she's really desperate, she can climb up a tree. I don't think that, that, that she'll need to do that, though. Not today. I love that. I think that's incredible the way that we obviously we sit and we watch predators constantly going for the various prey species. But to see them make a concerted effort and go, right, we are moving in the direction of that lion. I'm going to chase them once and once because the chase is over. And I don't know where that lioness has gone. I also don't know how long it's going to take us to get there. I don't know if there's maybe another link road that goes that way. Hopefully there is. We'll see. as I can so we don't miss too much more action. Tristan is still sitting around Chitwood Dam looking at all sorts of wonderful creatures. Let's go back across to him. This is super interesting and hopefully the gremlins won't interfere in this but if you look here this thickney is busy displaying and kind of got its wings out and flapping about and the reason why it's doing it is because I'm pretty sure it's got chicks or eggs nearby and it's trying to fool the crocodile. You see the crocodile just below there? So it's trying to draw that crocodile's attention away from that area and trying to move it around. You see how the bird's watching the crocodile and then every now and then it kind of pulls its wings out and pretends like it's got a broken wing and tries to deceive See, there we go. So it's almost trying to distract the crocodile, follow me and come away from where these potential eggs or chicks could be. I don't see any chicks at the moment, but it's definitely a display that both lapwings and these thick knees will use regularly in order to disrupt and to detract attention away from their young ones. So it's interesting to watch. And this crocodile has just sneaked in slowly to see what's going on. And it's been kind of hanging around. It's also been sort of watching the weavers. And I wonder if it's not waiting for an unsuspecting weaver to just fly too close or for maybe one of the chicks or nests to fall into the water and now it's caught the attention of the thickney and so the thickney is also just trying to kind of keep the crocodile at bay but super interesting to watch this process you would think that that bird would have nothing to worry about from a crocodile given that that crocodile is quite large and the chances of that crocodile really going after small birds is probably quite slim it wouldn't really sustain a crocodile but at the end of the day the instinct kicks in and these birds try and keep the crocodile away from them it's amazing to watch you can see now everything's kind of calmed down a little bit the crocodile is just still sitting fairly close by it's edging slowly closer towards the bank it's kind of nose is if you look at the distance between the bank and the nose it's getting less and less and less so there is a slight movement 
going forward. And crocodiles are some of the most patient animals in the world when it comes to hunting. Not so much the crocs in the Mara. Those crocs just swim and smash everything that crosses. But these guys here in South Africa have to be a little bit more patient with the way that they do things. And so what they'll do is they'll just slowly just move their way forward and try and then get towards their prey item. But look, you can see how that bird is feigning injury. So it's not actually an injured bird at all. It's pretending to be injured so is that the crocodile will, will keep its attention on it rather than maybe the chicks or the eggs that are fairly close by and they'll do this with monitor lizards crocodiles even sometimes land-based predators like leopard and various others so it's all just a show it's really that, that that bird is not injured in any way whatsoever it's just trying to keep the croc at bay now there's also a green-backed heron that's come onto the scene that's busy watching what's going on and that's one of the most clever or intelligent birds that we have in this particular section. They are birds that will often use tools to hunt. We were alluding to it a few days ago but I've seen this bird using bread, I've seen it using insects, I've seen it using all kinds of different things in, in a attempt to lure fish towards the edge of the water which it can then grab so super intelligent bird that's and also a very pretty bird it's got this kind of greenish back and that's where it gets its name from and then those yellow legs and eye patch area that can identify it as a green-backed heron so Roshni Plovers will most definitely adapt a similar mechanism to what the Thickney just displayed. I've seen lapwings and plovers do it regularly. So most of the birds around water like this will often have these kind of techniques. And it's, it's more suited towards the, the, croc, uh, the monitor lizards. So the Nile monitors, they are terrible for birds that have eggs near water. And they'll go after them. Even the crocodile themselves have problems with the monitor lizards. But if a crocodile does come along, well, the bird's still going to do the same technique in order to try and keep it at bay. And look at how close it is. It's amazing actually how close they are together. You wouldn't think that a bird would be brave enough to get that distance from a crocodile. And, and most certainly if it was a mammal at that distance, that crocodile would have lashed out and tried to go after it. And so it's an interesting kind of take on how things go. The bird is probably a little bit more nimble than some of our other mammalian friends. And that's why the crocodile hasn't launched itself just yet. But this particular dam, I've seen a number of different birds get caught out by these crocodiles. These crocodiles have hunted many an Egyptian goose at Chitra Dam. I've seen them go after some of these green-backed herons before. I've seen them going after even these thick knees. And I've once seen a crocodile grab a thick knee, but most of the time they're too slow and they miss completely. Also doves quite a lot of the time. They do grab doves as well. So there's a number of different birds that do get hit by them. Gillian, you're asking if I know if it's Vlad or Boris. I'm not sure, Gillian, and to be honest, I don't know. It doesn't look quite big enough to be Vlad. I think it might be Boris. I think Vlad is, is a slightly larger crocodile, and its head is a lot bigger than that. So yeah, I think this might be Boris, but I might be wrong as well. It's difficult to tell the difference between the two of them when it's just the head. And Vlad is obviously a lot larger than what Boris is, and so it's going to be interesting, hopefully, that particular crocodile comes out onto the bank and we can actually get a better estimate of its size but just judging by the head size it looks like it's probably Boris and, and not Vlad. And also of course there could be a new crocodile that's here you never know as we get rain and things like that so crocodiles will, will move and you'll find a situation where they'll go from puddle to puddle and eventually get themselves towards a water hole and we saw it last year with with Boris how much he moved in fact Brent even tracked him on a bushwalk the one time and found him sleeping under a shady bush and so they do move quite a bit in the summer months they they'll move around particularly at night and they will then try and kind of figure out where they can settle into a nice watery hole that will allow them to be safe and to be camouflaged and to be able to find food now our croc has gone underwater and is probably going to move away from these lap wings i mean not lap wings thick knees and so while i kind of watch what else is going on at chitra dam let's go back to taylor who i believe has got some topi The police are here and they're coming with reinforcements. They're snorting at the lioness that was eating her breakfast. Everyone's sort of just hanging around. Thompson's gazelle also standing, staring in that direction. Now, I can't find the other lioness. I don't know where she's going. We'll sit this way. <laughs> My earpiece falling out. She's 
duck. She's in that river line somewhere, or that lugger. She's not coming out. I think she's a bit uh, traumatized. But the other girl is just there. There's also a, a raptor of sorts flying around. I didn't quite see what it was. And the jackal. I think so that's very pretty. Uh, my monitor is so dirty. What are you, kite? Were you, it's even flies No, maybe a buzzard. Oh, couldn't see very well, staring straight up into the glare. Uh, it, it, no, I didn't think it was a kite. It didn't have a forked tail, so it might have been a an an auger buzzard or a, uh, a juvenile of some sort. Sorry, I didn't get a proper view. It wasn't particularly large, though. But there's our lioness just sitting, and where's our jackal friend gone? If you go a little bit to the right, in the same line, I think there's the jackal. There's the black back jackal. Just sitting very patiently waiting in hope that there will be some scraps left over after uh, she's moved on. I don't think she'll be there for too much longer either. I think uh, it's just a small tasty snack. Going to gobble it up and probably move on shortly after she's finished. There's so many things around at the moment that are shouting lion, lion. And, and also uh, the buffalo that we saw earlier that chased uh, the... And the lion off into the distance, they're slowly coming this way. And we have obviously seen that there's no tolerance shown uh, for the lions by the buffalo. And she's up. So a small meal like that put a good um, bulge on her belly. That'll keep her going. You might be able to hear the topi snorting. This sounds like someone blowing their nose when the topi snort. It's not quite like an impala alarm. And even the jackal is now. The jackal's following the lion. Going straight in there. What did you get? Did you find anything? Or did, oh, there's two. There we go. Probably eating some leftovers, maybe some stomach content, some intestines, bits of bone, maybe even the head of the animal. They're very, very happy. There we go. So patience does pay off. Especially when you're a jackal, it means a free meal. Very cool. Off she goes. And there's a topi. Not worried. Now, you can see the lioness is not even interested in the topi either. But a topi could quite easily outrun. Or even a Thompson's gazelle. The fact that they know she's there, there's no way that that lioness is going to get away. Look at this. This is the most incredible thing I've seen with the lions in the Mara. How the lionesses will often mark territories. And I've watched a lioness from, I don't know which pride it was now. The pride of lions that has the kinky tail lioness. And she did that. She urinated along one of the main roads into trees. So I don't think that that was just a, a, a normal urination. Often when they come through, you'll see them scent marking like that. And I promise you, it's the most bizarre. Very, very prominent sort of uh, eyebrows, don't you think? They're, they're quite light in color compared to the rest of it. There's another mammal in the background, a warthog. You see, she hasn't quite wiped her face just yet. I think she's going to clean herself up now. Now, it is very, very far away. We can't get any closer, unfortunately. We were lucky enough to have this view, though. And look at that. That's so cool. What a great shot. Hey, Darby, straight back into work, eh? No wasting time. <laughs> that um, termite mound that's between her, uh, the lioness and the warthog, I would imagine... Uh, maybe she managed to snatch her last piglet as they try to run for cover. Or mongoose would live in there. Let's see, I'm just coming out, hiding away. But the buffalo is starting to get a bit antsy now. They're obviously hearing the alarm calls and wondering what is alarming. What are they alarming at? You can see them all there. In desperate times, of course, it can happen. There's a documentary about a big male lion eating a hyena and he, that he hunted. Uh, he, well, he stumbled across and he killed it and ate it. He was desperate. So I think it's when they're absolutely desperate. But they will kill Jackal. Sometimes what a Jackal will do is because they're tough little creatures. They're like Jack Russells of the bush, I suppose. And that they... Um, can get slapped around a little bit and uh, you know, might pretend to play dead. I have heard stories of going to be on a lion sort of menu, you know, Ooh, I feel like jackal this evening. I suppose it can be a bit of a nuisance. One of my, one of the greatest sightings, where well, she just in general is when you see lions walking down the road and, and jackals tailing them. That's always quite entertaining. You hear the jackal too, making that sort of yelping noise. Bitch. 
That's so funny. I can't see the jackal. I can just see the lion's tail. <laughs> they are so cheeky. I'm hiding again. They're probably upset that they didn't get enough left. They're saying, you are greedy. You ate everything and you only left us a tiny scrap. You know, a jackal's not happy with that lion. Cheeky animals, though. Trying to encourage her to move off. I suppose it's like mobbing with a bird. You just get annoyed. Um, Anna Marie, great question. You're wondering if Maras have certain prey that they prefer, uh, or lions in the Mara, sorry. Uh, and the answer to that is, I suppose it's seasonal. When the migration's on, it's not particularly difficult for a lion to catch a zebra or a wildebeest because there's so many of them. <laughs> she doesn't care about that jackal whatsoever, though. They just flop down. And, and then it changes. Uh, at this time of the year, they feed on a lot of warthog when the migration moves off. Uh, they'll take whatever they can get. Remember, they are opportunistic. Um, but during the migration, the peak of the migration, they most certainly will be favoring zebra and wildebeest. Otherwise, it take, literally will take anything else. Jackal, you better be careful because if the lion charges after you, they're, they're quick. Jackal are sneaky creatures. They are very, very quick. Just hear it. Yep. Rap. Rap. Going straight towards her again. Very brave. No. Where did she go? I can't even see her. Oh, she's walking away now. Oh, we can catch up to her. Shall we get a better view, Darby? Let me... We can, should we get nice and close to this line. Well, she'll decide if she wants to partake in that, of course, but they're so relaxed here. Yeah. I'm going to have a look here because she might walk straight towards us. She's actually walking past some Thompson's Gazelle. It's going to be quite nice. And the buffalo might chase exciting let's see she's walking there we'll just let her walk in front of the we'll let her walk in front and between the cars because there's another vehicle just standing in the distance also uh, enjoying this it's nice it's a private sighting today there's only been two of us which i absolutely love i'm very selfish when it comes to sightings let's be honest no no need to hide that <laughs> there she goes just stopping looking around you better be careful i don't think she's realized because she was so focused on eating her meal that the other lioness, who I, I imagine she's looking for her now, I don't even think she knows that she got chased by the buffalo. She didn't turn around and look, and I could hear the buffalo running. I mean, that's what uh, caught my attention and why I looked in that direction. And she was completely oblivious to it. She was just indulging on her, on her meal. Just walking straight across of her. She's getting closer to the buffalo. Now the writer's end, you're wondering how many prides and lions are there in the Maasai Mara? The answer to that is many and I would not be able to name them all for you. Uh, unfortunately, it's, I don't even, I don't even think, unless you're Tristan, uh, who can name every leopard and lion pride and coalition within the Sami sand. <laughs> I've not got that talent, but there, there are lots of them around here. And because the prides get so big, big you often find um, sort of breakaways and, and smaller groups um, leaving the prides. So it's it's difficult to say. So then, you know, they, they, they'll still go back and, and sometimes visit the main prides, but then they'll spend most of their time on their own. Sort of like what we see with the Nguhumas. We obviously see Amber Eyes and the youngest Nguhuma lioness have taken a liking to one another. There we go, just walking right past that car with the jackal in hot pursuit. And that is so funny. That is a brave little character. This is actually the highlight for my drive. It's not the lion, but this jackal. Where are you going? Are you hoping she's going to catch something else? Or are you just making sure you're showing your wife how big and strong you are? Because there were two jackals here and their arm and is running right up to her. Bite her on the tail. See what she does. <laughs> it's as if it's mum and offspring going for a stroll across the Mara Plains, but of course that's not what's happening. Like, there you go, announcing how upset he is. <laughs> Isn't that funny that another predator is shouting at the other predator, telling everybody, Lions coming everyone! Get out the way, lions! 
They are, that's why I say they're like the Jack Russells because they can be annoying. They should just nip at the ankle constantly. Oh, there's the other jackal running across just in front. There we go. So both of them are around now. Maybe we're watching an attack. Maybe these jackal are going to take that lion down. I'm joking. That's, of course, absolutely ridiculous that that wouldn't happen. But they're very unhappy. And that one on the left is now beelining straight towards her. What a cool sighting. Every single day is always so different in the bush. But it just seems to be spectacular in the Mara. It really outdoes itself constantly. And the buffalo have also decided to let her go, which is quite nice. Now, Rebecca in Final Control would like to know how far away are the jackal from the lioness. That jackal's probably only about three or four meters away. It's very close. So, so, so close. But she's not interested, and it's not a threat to her. It's, it really is. It's an absolute nuisance. But she's obviously so used to it that she's just completely oblivious to it. If she wasn't really, really annoyed, she probably would have turned around and growled and, and chased the jackal a little bit. And, and then they would have run away and then come back because that's what jackals do. They always come back. They're sneaky. But um, they, they, maybe they're just uncomfortable with her, her being in their territory. Now, Tammy, you're wondering if a jackal is part of the fox family. Well, a jackal is actually part of the Canada family. Um, so, uh, what foxes, and they look very similar. I mean, they, they're pretty much exactly the same thing, except I think jack, uh, foxes make more of a howling noise, more of a screech rather than... Although jackals howl too, especially the blackback jackal. They're very vocal creatures, obviously. We've clearly seen that today. But they're, they're, all, they're all, I suppose, distant relatives of, of dogs, very, you know, long, 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 long time ago. See, now she looks like she's getting a little bit annoyed. The way she swished her tail like that, as if to just to say, leave me alone. Joe, <laughs> this is morbid, but okay. Do I think that the jackal are following this lioness because they're worried about the lioness eating the jackal babies? Maybe. Maybe they have a den nearby and they're just escorting her out. That's what I, I, so I think it's maybe a territory thing. I think they live around here. And quite rightly, we've been seeing a lot of jackal dens at the moment, uh, well, over the last month or so. And uh, so, yeah, so possibly they're just making sure that she goes out and, and doesn't come back. And if she does get too close to the den, maybe they would try and lure her away or annoy her out of the way so that's definitely it again though no, she wouldn't want to eat the jackal babies she'd probably kill them if she came across them but she's not not going to eat them unless she's absolutely starving i love that bodyguards or figures <laughs> Buffalo. The buffalo have completely ignored her. Well, they watched her as she walked away. But we've got to go all the way around now. It's so funny. Very, very funny. Ooh, let's go around. We'll, we'll just quickly race past everybody as quick as we can. And we'll try and catch her again. Now, ASM, you're wondering if uh, jackals are faster than lions. Uh, they might have a quicker reaction time because they're so much smaller in terms of like turning and darting off. Uh, but no, a, a lion probably will run, run quicker than a jackal. Might be about the same. Jack will probably keep the speed up for a little bit longer. I always joke and I say it's not very often that you get to see a jackal walking. They're either trotting or they're, you know, cantering or galloping or running at full speed or whatever. There's sort of no in between with a jackal. Uh, except today, hang on. The buffalo are coming up to those lions. I'm just going to pick up the pace. I'm seeing at the moment because there's a group of buffalo and I'm also focusing on the road. There's a group of buffalo that look like they are going towards her, but it's too, it's very far and I want to try and get a bit closer. Ah! I'm sure you all love coming on a Ferrari safari with me. We're not far away. It's okay. It's no problem. We just need to get around which is the annoying part. These roads, they're, they're beautiful. They snake in all sorts of different directions and sometimes you just want them to go straight. Okay, we're jumping on a main road now. 
Okay, are you ready? Go! What car am I in? Pucker. For a moment I forgot which vehicle I was driving. So she's disappearing into the tree line. I think the buffalo have given up. It just looked like some of the, the Dugger boys that were further away from the main the main herd. Also again, like the uh, like the jackals, just sort of ushering out, just going, yeah, yeah, on your way, keep going. Oh no, she's gonna go into a spot where I don't know if we're gonna be able to get. Um, I'm gonna go around, I'm gonna go, cool. Let's go through here. She's about to disappear though. I think we may have already lost her. She's gone into the same tree line. The jackals are still there. I'll try to be quick, Darby. But I think this is going to be the end of the sighting from this side. But she's just racing straight into the trees. There we go. That's the last view. And the blackback jackals will, were still running around there. But the buffalo are giving up and watching her disappear. That's probably where the other lioness is. I haven't seen her come out. Uh, so maybe she's found a nice spot uh, just resting away there, uh, keeping out of the wind. It's a bit sad because only one of them has got a relatively full belly. The other was left empty-handed. But a good spot, though, uh, to rest. Yeah, very cool. Okay, well, well, we'll try to go around. We'll see if we can get a better view. But I don't think so. Let me just turn. Bye, lions. Okay, yeah, we'll try and get another view of those girls because they're provoking prov to be <laughs> amazing. Let's uh, go across to Tristan who has got some creatures with feathers. Snuck away and this young oak followed her. And <laughs> <laughs> there is a bird in a tree, Taylor McCurdy. There is a beautiful Birchall's kukul. And this kukul is calling, which means that maybe, just maybe, rain is on fall like that and they make a lot of noise then it typically means that there is a bit of rain cover oh, but I'm hoping that it will do it again it's such a nice sound it's like this liquid bubbly sound that they make I really like it and it's like I say they very seldom are these birds wrong when they call and you hear them calling for a few days generally you do get some decent rain I don't know why they're able to pick it up but they are and they do have never failed me in the past in terms of when rain is imminently coming and You'll find them a lot in areas like this. They like these riverine thickets. They kind of bounce around between all the bushes and try and just kind of camouflage and hunt various insects and things that are out here. So quite common to see them around this area. But nice find nonetheless. It was good to see and good to hear. And hopefully rain is on the way. Even though it's nice when it's dry. Actually, there goes another one that's just flown past. So it's quite cool. Um, it's nice when it's dry because obviously for our game viewing purposes, it's, it's a lot easier. We find our leopards a lot quicker because they tend to go to the only water sources that there are, which are few and far between. But in terms of the bush and in terms of the health of the ecosystem, some rain would be really quite nice. You can see already that the green grass is starting to take on that drier tinge already. It's starting to kind of dry up and not really look the way it's supposed to. It's starting to have a bit more brown color and that's not really what we want to see out of the grass at this time of the year. We want our grass to be lush and green and growing and so that our herbivores have lots of food and hopefully that then means things like our buffalo come back which will then hopefully dry our lines back and so that's why we want a bit of rain is it might not be great for the time being but it will certainly help us in a few months time or next winter at least when we've got a nice cover of grass and lots of vegetation for all of our animals to eat so that's the plan at least now uh, there was a what looked like a gray-headed bush shrike that just flew past us and into this quarry bush so I just want to try an edge can you see it Vildi? Okay, let's try to get up. May, you're asking what the follow-on effect is of a drought. Oh no, this bird is giving us a nightmare here. There it is through the branches, Willie. I don't know if you're going to be able to get it. But there is a grey-headed bushrike that is flying there. So May, I'll get to your question shortly. We're just going to try and see if we can show you the bushrike. It's up in the um, acacia, in the knobthorn, Willie. 
It's a little bit obscured by a number of branches, unfortunately, as the bird is hopping about all over the place, as bushrikes tend to do. But it is one of our prettier birds, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get it because it's flying all over the place. But may the knock-on effects of drought are quite numerous. You get the biggest, probably the biggest damage that is done is there is a severe amount of overgrazing that happens during drought times. You get a situation where literally animals eat everything, and we saw that last year, and that means then that a lot of the nutritious grasses are overgrazed and, and then you get a situation where it rains and erosion starts to happen and there's you know a lot of the topsoil is washed away and the nutrient layer is gone and then you get a lot of the pioneer species growing which are not very palatable for our antelope species and that means we then get less of our grazers which means less dung that's being dropped less fertilization of the soil and therefore poorer quality food and so not too many animals around and then also not too many predators so it's not great from that point of view that's probably one of the worst things also the animals themselves lose condition through these dry periods we know that the buffalo last year really got into seriously bad condition and actually it ended up killing a lot of them because as soon as it rained and they started to feed off the more nutrient rich grass their stomachs just weren't used to it and a lot of them actually died from diarrhea and losing sort of nutrient nutrients that way even though food started to become available in about October last year so the, the knock-on effects of that is, is huge in, in terms of that a lot of the animals lose condition and, and it becomes harder for them to be able to reproduce you found last year that there was a number of stillborn buffalo there was a number of uh, well, far less number of impala lambs and so the populations of our herbivores was far less now there's a shadow coming over me which means I've got to look towards the Sun because it seemed like a bird of prey that was flying somewhere here yes there is a Wahlberg's Eagle but it is flying right into the Sun Vildi so don't worry about it it is circling somewhere in that general vicinity but I'm not going to ask VM to blind us all with the Sun and certainly not blind himself but there was just a shadow that came over me and I was hoping that it was going to go a little bit forward, further forward and around it looked like a Wahlberg's Eagle and it's probably the Wahlberg's Eagle that nests just in front here there's a big nest that they're busy building and we've actually seen them sitting on it I don't see them today but I'm pretty sure that's the bird now that there's a few thermals rising that individuals probably up and flying and looking for any signs of food now I've come past twin dams again just to see if I missed something this morning with regards to Hosanna's tracks nothing really happening though unfortunately there's no tracks that I can see the impalas that we saw this morning still milling around there so I don't think Hosanna has even come past in this area he must have gone somewhere but I just don't see where his tracks cross from where we left him where we left him was just on our left hand side here and it is really dense and thick and so I'm not sure where he could have gone but I'm going to carry on with my adventure as Rebecca calls it and while I'm adventuring around I believe Taylor McCurdy also has some feathered friends of her own We do, we've got some grey crown cranes and David is very excited because they're so close to the car after filming lions very far away. He's happy about that. Now they're moving around and in a lugger at the moment feeding, which is quite cool because I haven't actually seen them in the water before. And they keep plopping in and out. There'll be so much food along this lugger and I think they're going to follow it for most of the day, I would imagine. I, I couldn't see why they'd want to go anywhere else. Now, and it's quite deep though, because when they were in the water, I must tell you, basically the, feather, the water was up to underneath their feathers on their tummy. Half their body disappeared. And off they go again. They've got beautiful long legs though. But they don't use their feet like a secretary bird would to stomp. They use that beak and, and they peck away as you can see. So I'm sure there'll be some frogs around here. There's the other one in the water now too. It's very beautiful around here. And our lions have not come out also just to give you that quick update. I think they're going to stay and down in there. Not so difficult to tell the difference between male and female. They, there's no sexual dimorphism. It's not like a, a um, saddle-billed stalk where the male's got the little yellow wattles, which makes it quite easy. And yellow red wattles. I can't even remember what a saddle-billed stalk looks like these days. Um, that helps a little bit. It almost looks like they're working together, though. When they feed in such close proximity, if one chases something out and misses it, well, then at least the partner gets it. And they are monogamous, so they will care for one another. We find male be quite kind and, and help um, with feeding. What are you doing? Sort of 
puddles or these luggers hiding away in the grass because they need the grass, of course, otherwise they, they will stand out. Even though they do have natural com uh, camouflage, I mean, a bird would quite easily see a frog out in the open, but if you've got a bit of grass and some sticks and things to hide around, and uh, also helps as obstacles. If you need to get away, you know, maybe that bird will struggle. See, there's a couple of splashes in the water. I don't know if it's them moving through it or if it is the frogs hopping off the bank and into the water. I wonder if there are any crabs here, any freshwater crabs. I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any freshwater mussels either. Well, down in the Eastern Cape, lots and lots of freshwater mussels are, are around. And even in the Sabi sand, there are some areas where you'll find... Beautiful. Ah, <laughs> oh, cool. So it seems as though we've got a bit of. Um, oh, oh, hang on. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, that's of course. They do a beautiful dance. I've never seen it when they caught one another. And I love the way they almost put their, head, their necks together as if they were hearts. So maybe if you can try and do a screenshot. That's amazing. Very nice. Well, it seems as though we have got similar sightings out and about today. Jamie is also with some crown cranes. Do not adjust your set. It seems as though Taylor and I in two different parts of the Mara are experiencing something very similar. Although my crown cranes are not dancing in the same way that Taylor's were. But it seems as though Taylor's having one of those extraordinary mornings once again. They really are strikingly lovely birds. Owls are not after frogs, they're after seeds, by the looks of things, plucking away at the tops of grasses. There's some, there's a minor thing. It upsets me that the, the brown on the back doesn't match the red of the wattle. It would just add that extra element to these birds. They really are extravagant, even by bird standards. Rebecca tells me that contrast is trendy right now. I'm inclined to take her word for it, given my entire lack of fashion sense and indeed color coordination. I'm very good at khaki and green, and that's about it. So I'll, I'll take Rebecca's word for it. I will, I will assume that that is the newest trend. The crest, though, that crest will never go out of fashion. Fuzzman, no, I've never seen crowned craned chicks. I would love to see cr cr <laughs> crowned crane chicks. Crowned crane chicks, crowned crane chicks, crowned crane chicks. Okay, I can do it. I it's really hard to say. Um, it's something that I would really enjoy, and I think we will. I think we will see them in the morrow while we're out here following along behind the adults i have no doubt it will be something very special do you know what i'm super excited about is our trip to uganda in a week i'm going to go and see shoe bulls cheryl no crown cranes are not like flamingos um, their diet is obviously flamingos are very much into crustaceans of the water systems that's of course what gives them their their pinkish color is the pigment from the shrimps that they eat. Um, they also, crowned cranes don't tend to stand on one leg. I think that that is where, where nature stopped in terms of the extravagant peculiarities of this particular bird. Uh, they're not, they're part of the crane family, so something like a blue crane, which is of course the national bird of South Africa, would be closely related to the crowned crane. Blue crane chicks is also much easier to say than crowned crane chicks. So no, they're not, they're not closely, closely related to flamingos. That's another thing we need to see here. We need to go to the lakes in Kenya and go and see, go to Lake Nakuru and go and see the flamingos there. They do wade in water, which is, I suppose, a similarity. As far as I know, flamingos are the only are the only bird in their order in terms of their classification. 
Now, shoe balls. I'm sorry, I'm stuck on the shoe balls now. I'm so excited to go and see a shoe ball. Let me show you what a shoe ball looks like. Oh, goodness, I'm throwing things everywhere. Give me one moment to show you what a shoe ball looks like. Because I'm very... Oh, no, hold on. Yes, I know I haven't backed up in a while. Thank you for telling me. This is what a shoe ball looks like. Okay, that's a busted. And you only find them in certain areas and we're going on a specific tour to go and see shoe balls. and they're massive birds over a meter tall oh by the way speaking of massive birds thank you so much to those of you who did the the photoshopping deal or whatever you would call it um, I really appreciate it with the comparison of the Cory Bustard and myself standing next to it that was really very useful and essentially very similar in size to the shoe ball similar to, uh, close more closely related to storks although it is something completely completely different I am excited I cannot wait to go and see the shoe balls in real life I've never seen one before it's one of those birds that is high up on my list of priorities okay thank you cranes you are very beautiful now I've got to find my way out of here I'm in a maze oh I have something to show you I forgot. Oh no, hold on. I'm not going to show you it yet. I'm going to send you over to Tristan because he apparently has some birds that might decide to fly away on him. Now, we're at Treehouse Dam trying to see if we can find any other little things lurking around. And there's a few interesting birds. There's actually some red-breasted swallows that are busy trying to collect mud. And they go in and out of frame. There, there's one right now, just at the bottom, down by the water. There's a red-breasted swallow. So these are one of the migratory birds we do get in the summer months. And you see, look, it's collecting beakfuls of mud, which it will then fly away towards where the nest is being constructed. And it will pack that mud in to form a beautiful, beautiful nest. And it's amazing to watch them do this. And they just go back and forth all day and both partners are doing it so both male and female will be here doing the exact same thing which is really cool now there were some zebras you can see they are just drifting now way away 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 from us now their little bottoms are disappearing into the bush so a nice little herd of zebras that was down a treehouse dam there was also a warthog that was wallowing at some point that also ran away and so quite a few animals it's because it's getting quite warm now that's why we're starting to see some of these animals head in this direction but we're going to carry on anyway we unfortunately every Everything seems to be departing the scene rather than coming to it and so sitting here we're just going to end up being rather lonely except for I suppose I've got VM's company VM I've got your company don't I yes there we go so I won't be completely lonely if I were to stay here but I can tell you one thing, it is starting to get a little warm out here. I think it's going to be a really nice hot day and that should bode well for this afternoon's affairs and its afternoon's proceedings. And so hopefully we'll have a nice afternoon of many animals towards water. Now there's a weaver actually building its nest here. I want to actually see which weaver it is. And earlier at Tripler Dam I was starting to address something and starting to talk about weavers and their yellow coloration. And Judy H asked me the other day about about how do I have any tricks or tips to identify these different yellow and black weavers and how we go about figuring out which ones are which. Now, Judy H, there's a, there's a couple of weavers out here that we get really kind of quite confused and that's the lesser mast, the southern mast and the village weaver but each one of them has a different identifying feature and so I'm going to show you in the book because it's going to be much easier than that weaver that's hanging upside down and is not really being able to see it in the shadows but on top we'll start with the village weaver. Now the village weaver is the one that's at Chitwa at the moment, the one that's building those nests that you saw there. Now the village weaver will have a very red eye as you can see probably there's best is if you have a look a nice deep red eye and then a black facial mask that goes from the beak around the eye and then down towards the throat it's a it's far less black on the village weaver than what you'll see on the southern mast weaver you see the southern mast weaver has more of a black section that goes over the top of the head and kind of comes then from there down to the eye whereas the village is from the beak across and then if you look at the lesser mask it's very easy because it's got the light colored eye so it's got a completely different colored eye and a lot more black on the head than what you would see in either of the other two species and so those are the three really difficult ones to ID in this particular section of the world um, 
there are one or two others and these guys here we won't see them nesting in the same way as what we saw those weavers building their nests at Chitwa and, and the southern mast and lesser mast weavers as well. Now James, sorry Rebecca, if you can just repeat some of that question. I got something about weavers and, and is it the same here, but I didn't get the whole question. If you can just repeat all of it for me please. The nest shape of weavers, no, it's not area specific. Each individual species has specific ways that they will build their nests. So a mast weaver, a, um, a village weaver, a lesser mast weaver, they all have different shapes, red-headed weavers, and each one will have its own kind of structure and its own tunnel shape, and you can tell them apart. Now there is this theory about um, the buffalo weavers and, and them building their nests in, in terms of facing the sun and facing in a north sort of westly direction but and to be honest I have seen many a tree that does not have any obstructions, any shade or anything and they will nest so on the southern, eastern, northern so I don't know if that holds any truth to it but in terms of area specific no, not that I've ever seen, they just build their nests according to species specific constructs so it's just each species has its own way of building. You might find the position of the nest on a tree might differ in different areas you might find that they try and look for areas where there's a little bit of sun um, for the keep the to help keep the chicks warm but not in direct sun in the midday and still tries to have a little bit of shade so you might find those kind of things but generally it's more species specific than anything else right now it seems like one person this morning who hasn't something else that she would like to show you all I have struggled with talking though, Tristan. Words could not escape my mouth quicker this morning. Anyways, we have, we've got the triangle boys, I suspect, laying in the grass. There's one of them. And then the other fella, who was also fast asleep just a moment ago, has very kindly decided to pop his head up, which was nice of him. And there they sit. They are lovely boys, hey? They really are beautiful. I haven't seen all four together. I think it's mainly just three of them that hang about and then occasionally the fourth one is sighted with them which is also not too uncommon that can happen uh, quite regularly amongst coalitions of males. And there is a pride of lions. You can't see them right now. I need to get a better position. But the, but the thing is, I don't know which pride of lions it is because they said there's some cubs here. So I wonder if the Ngama pride didn't just turn around and do a big loop back and, and end up in this area. Hmm. I think that's the case. I think that's what's happened. Now, there was a question... From Philip, and, and it is about the cars, and you're wondering why are the vehicles painted green if the animals are habituated to, well, the cars? Because it would be very strange if you were driving around on safari and you saw a pink vehicle and a white vehicle. They don't necessarily blend into the bush very well. So it's why we typically just wear khaki guys. So it's, it's not um, anything to do with the animal at all. It's just one of those things, but it's just the preferred sort of more professional ways to have a uh, more natural colored car so it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb so that's really the only reason behind it because you're quite right animals will habituate to v various vehicles it's like in the Kruger uh, for example even yeah because you can drive your own vehicle around in the Mara Triangle and the Ma uh, Masai Mara National Reserve too and um, people have a variety of different colors of cars and you don't see the animals having uh, too much of a worry now earlier Jamie was talking about darting I'll tell you a story with car colors and, and darting now. Basically, uh, when I was working in the Eastern Cape, the conservation manager's vehicles were, were white. They, they weren't khaki colored at all because they were also on the roads. It was just um, a pick, basically a type of a pickup truck. And we used to do the darting from the pickup trucks because we didn't want the animals to start getting scared of the safari vehicles. And I did notice that whenever the elephants or lions or whatever we were darting would see a white vehicle, they'd get a little bit antsy. And I, but that was just, again, it was, a, it was a reserve. The animals couldn't migrate naturally. It's 25,000 hectares, so just almost you know 55,000 acres of land, roughly. So... They started associating, I think, also the shape of the car. It was a very different shape of the car to the safari vehicles that we were driving and, and the color and maybe the fact that it was petrol, not a diesel, too. So it could have been the smell. But you would, you would see, and then you'd come in with a safari vehicle and they'd be completely relaxed. But bring a white car near them, that particular make of vehicle, 
and then one's running for the hills. I don't blame them though, I really don't. So the, the underneath that tree, you might see some other cars um, just to the left. Keep going a little bit more, the, the tree that's on the corner, there we go. You can see some white things underneath the tree. Those are the lions. I don't know how many lions are there, but apparently they're females and cubs. So I'm starting to think now with the number of bodies or bits and pieces of bodies that you can see. I think this could be the Ngama Pride. They must have done a huge walk last night. Because we are very, very far away from where we left them. That's incredible. And there's all the other vehicles. We're watching them this morning too. But our males are fast asleep. They, do they have big bellies? Not massive. They're, they're not hungry. They're not starving. Now, Nicole, you're wondering if, it, if male lions always stick together or do they sometimes go their own ways? Most certainly. Of course they do. You might have a coalition uh, form and then something happens and one decides to leave or two decides to leave and the whole coalition will split up um, and that, that's the beauty of nature is that there, are, there really are no rules set in stone everything is sort of comes and goes and, and like I was saying earlier animals do whatever they want whenever they want all the time they don't let any laws sort of uh, defy them so so for these boys uh, obviously three of them have got a very strong bond and there's one that maybe he's just happy li living on his own and just popping through whenever you can there's some vehicles behind me so what i might do is i might just move up a little bit further forward just to um we can go and look at the other one we're lucky we've got a long camera whereas this fella is much easier for the guys who don't have big cameras uh to get some good shots so we'll let them do not do we'll let them look at that line and then maybe we can even get a better view here so this might work out for us actually actually let's see if we can figure out how many lines are laying here Okay. It's so hard. It's such a small little gap, and they're right on the edge of a lugger. And there is a road on the other side, but I think it'd be quite cramped anyway with the cars around there. So I'm quite happy to view them from this side. Three adults. It's so hard. I'm trying. I'm just trying to figure out. It's not impossible that the Engama Pride could have walked that distance and come this way. Um, I mean, they travel huge distances if they want to in one night. And I don't think that the Olololo females would have come this far. So then, those two other lionesses that we saw, who are they? And who do they belong to? And I have seen two lionesses along that tree line before. I think they were part of the marsh breakaways. So maybe that was them. I don't know if they're part of this part, or maybe they are. It's so hard to say because there's so many different lines when, within such close proximity of one another. Oh, those two little fluff balls just listening to all the cars moving around. I'll get trying to get comfy again. Hopefully they did catch something if this is in Gama Pride and uh, they've been able to suckle their cubs a little bit. So cool. We are so lucky. I can't believe from struggling to find lions within the first hour. Hey, David, now, have you got your lion fix yet? <laughs> We've shown, shown him so many, many lions this morning. Very, very lucky. I suppose just right place at the right time in the end. Uh, it took a while, you know, to get on track. You can't always have it from the get-go. Sometimes you've got to be a bit patient. It's been a nice, very drive today. We've seen a bit of everything, lions and birds. Uh, lots of antelope species, buffalo tables being turned, you know, prey chasing predator, jackals, you know, it's quite cool. It's nice. Sometimes you get stuck and you'll just see lions or you'll just see zebra or a buffalo. Well, I'm always quite happy to see so many uh, different things. Oh, there's lots and lots of vehicles. Okay, I'm going to... The guys are just coming past me, which is okay. So, I think, I don't know if they want to have a view or... So you can just hear the vehicles moving past at the moment. But these lines will probably stay here for most of the day underneath the under the shade of this tree. I don't see why they would need to move. They've got water close by. There is lots and lots of prey gathering in the distance. And I think I might come back here this afternoon. I think this is where we will start our day off. Because we're not too far off of the road either. It's, it's, it's okay. It's not so bad. We are now being photographed, David. Smile. Let those pearly whites shine. 
Oh, great. Okay, well, I think we're going to leave these lines because they're fairly flat and they're not doing too much. Uh, so I'm going to send you back across to Tristan in South Africa. And I'm not sure what he's got planned for everybody, but I'm sure he'll let you know. I'm looking at the vulture is what I'm doing for the last few minutes of my drive. I know a number of you have been asking how our vulture chick is doing. And, well, you can see it's getting big. That's the vulture. I think it's the chick that's sitting on top of the nest. You can just see its wings facing back towards us and then some legs going down. It's a bit difficult to see since a bit of rain. There's a lot of vegetation that's now grown around the nest itself. You can see lots of green leaves. And so it's actually quite difficult to make out whether it's the chick or the adult. But I think it's still the chick. I think the adults are in this kind of heat will probably be off and scavenging already and so the chick is getting big it's starting to look more and more like an adult vulture every time I see it and the reason why we haven't seen too much of it is because unfortunately our reception here is not really that great and so I just took a bit of a chance and this morning seems as though we're going to get away with it even though we've had a few gremlins to start it seems as though everything is okay now now this chick I would imagine is going to start flying fairly shortly if you see the size of the wings now and, and the the primaries it looks like they're almost fully developed and I would imagine the short little flights are going to be the order of the day maybe even just hopping or flapping from branch to branch within the same tree might happen and there'll be a bit of exercise going on and then shortly after that they'll start Will eventually be fully fledged and should probably be flying if my maths is correct somewhere around December it should be off and flying quite well and away from the nest itself and then you'll see it's still hanging around January February and then gone completely from this area so that the adults can start prepping their nest again for June July area where they will lay their next set of eggs and try and raise another giraffe I mean giraffe, vulture, I don't know why I said giraffe, I saw giraffe tracks just now, that's why, and there's a spider hunting wasp buzzing around my brain, and so I don't know why I've got to giraffe with spider hunting wasp and vulture, but it happens, and that's how it goes. <laughs> I think it's time for breakfast, VM. too much sun, maybe those petrol fumes from yesterday sorted me out and made me a little bit on the confused side of life. I don't know what's going on really, actually yesterday was the same, I was kind of mixing things up, and so Taylor says she's been struggling with speech, well... Taylor, don't worry, you're not the only one. I can't even get the difference between... Ah, hang on a second. There's a leopard. Not a real leopard, of course, but a leopard nonetheless. And you'll see what I'm talking about in two seconds, because right there is a massive leopard tortoise female. So, it is at least some kind of leopard in its name. And this is a massive girl. She's big, big, big. You can see she's got a deep shell. Look at how high she is from the bottom to the top. That is really cool. This will be an old individual. She could easily be, I would say, 60, 50, 60 years old, maybe even older than That we have this morning. I've seen a Spix hingeback tortoise this morning in the Mulawati, this leopard tortoise, we saw a tortoise yesterday, and as well as that Birchall's kukul calling means that rain is coming for sure. I think we're going to have a couple hot, hot days, and then the rain is starting, is going to start to come. But you can see, it must be incredibly difficult to be a massive tortoise of the sun. Look at how big and rounded that shape is, and the sun must be absolutely baking her, and so she's going to have to try and find a way to get to some shade. They do walk around a lot in the early hours of the morning, and in the afternoon when it's not as hot because they don't then lose as much moisture and with the kind of heat that we've had recently a lot of these little water holes and mud wallows have actually dried up and so tortoises are going to have to walk quite long distances in order to get water that they need so we don't want to really get in its way too much we're going to let it kind of carry on moving past us I'm not going to reposition again once it moves but isn't it incredible the imagine how much power must be in those legs if you look at the size of the legs in relation to the size of that body oh we're going to have a little breakfast are we wonderful it's chomping on the nice green grass and i love watching tortoises feed they kind of have this odd motion as how they use their whole head and neck to be able to pluck little bits of grass and then down it goes but she's very chilled so if you're a bit worried about us being close by and if this tortoise was a bit stressed you can see in any time an animal starts to feed it means it comes completely relaxed with what's going on and is not really worried about us at all and is in fact actually coming closer rather than further away but how cool is that and you can see how well they blend in even if just it's in this open clearing and this kind of fire break area this tortoise still blends incredibly well and so it's not the leopard we were looking for but a leopard tortoise is still good in any day of the week i always miss these guys during the winter
Right, now we're going to leave our tortoise to have its breakfast as we meander our way home for our breakfast. And I believe Jamie is also going for breakfast and that's a lot of breakfast in one sentence. I'm very excited about breakfast. I am on my way towards breakfast. And the nice thing is because I'm close to home, it'll be a warm breakfast, which I'm very, very excited about. So, Miriam, you wanted to know if there are any creatures or monsters in I got asked this question a few weeks ago and I went to Shadrach, who is our mechanic who's from this area, and I asked him. And what we've organized is for the, um, the man who is the authority on these stories to come and visit us and tell us some of them so that we can share them with you. One of the creatures he told me about is a, a short-ish man with a massive head that um, apparently asks the Messiah for, for snuff. And if you don't give it to him, you get squashed was one of the stories. I've forgotten the name. It was a Maasai name, so it was a complicated one, or in Ma. And then there was another, there was ant-like creatures, walking trees as well, in the forests up above the escarpment. But I'll find out more for you and I'll get better details. Right, speaking of creatures, because I promised I had something to show you and I've been promising this for ages. Hopefully no one's behind me. There we go. There's the little badge of honor for those of us that belong to the Marshmallow Club. I made it ages ago, but this is the first time I've actually taken it out with me. It's been sitting in my pocket for a long time. So that's the, the Marshmallow Queen or King, the symbol. Taylor wanted me to wear Marshmallow earrings, um, or to, but that was when she thought I got stuck a second time, which I didn't. So there you go, the Marshmallow badge. I haven't had a chance to find a pin to glue it on, but what I'll do is I will put it here. Oh, um, and and just to just to have a little additional detail. There we go. There we go. Little marshmallow queen. For now, a little additional detail. Taylor, you did a marvelous job cutting out the the cello tape that I wrapped around it to help to keep it going and maintain it over the course of the next few weeks where I'm sure it will be blow about a little bit in true Kenyan style so there you go I did make it I promised I would it's there it'll travel with me So from our little marshmallow badge, um, let's go across to the Queen of the Scissors who apparently has fluffy looking marshmallow like things in a bush. I don't know if I like that. <laughs> we have found some fluffy marshmallows in the form of lions, more lions. Now I'm completely confused. Now I don't know what lions I've seen because there's another group here. There's more than seven or eight of them. I, and I'm pretty sure there are probably a couple of more just in the long grass. So I have absolutely no idea what lions I saw today. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. We are maybe 400, 500 meters from the previous Pride Alliance that we've just seen. And th that Pride is about 200, 250 meters away from the two other lioness that we saw earlier this morning. So I don't know if it's the Angama Pride split up or if it's the Angamas and the Ololoro females. I, I really can't tell. And also it's so difficult because we haven't been able to get a proper count either because everybody's just lounging about today as if it was Sunday. You know, some of us have got to work and it seems as though the lions have taken the day off today, except the first two who did the morning shift this slot. Maybe they'll be on for this afternoon show. Who knows? So I will definitely be coming along this road and and just exploring. And then hopefully they move closer to the road so we can see them because they're quite far away now. And then we can start putting two and two together and figure out who exactly we have been seeing because I'm now stumped. Uh, I mean, I've seen at least six or seven adult lionesses. We've seen two big males and a number of cubs of varying ages. So it's a tough one. It's quite a difficult thing to try and figure out. Hmm. <clears throat> I 
her I'm listening to her question. Now, a question from Jason, actually, and it was something I was about to talk about, too, was the sizes of territories, and you were wondering how much land does, you know, a pride of lions need? Again, it depends on the area. So, here, the density of lions is, is quite, quite big, so maybe they don't have as big a territories, but, but it depends. If they're in an area that hasn't got good grazing, you're not going to find a lot of prey species moving to those areas so their territory might have to be double the size to try and cover and, and move into areas where the grazing is better where the animals do um sort of come and feed on a regular basis whereas if you're maybe along the river line and you've got an open grassland and it's you know just favorable conditions for the prey your territory wouldn't have to be as large male territories are, are much bigger uh, we, we know that a coalition of males won't just see to one pride it's more likely that he's going to see to three or four other prides within the vicinity and then here of course the females also mark mark territories too um, but they will still have a home range so there'll be a certain spot where they go right this is ours and ours only no one else can come here and then there'll be sort of gray areas maybe watering holes or the river as a boundary things like that and they're just sitting there and they've eaten or not because they thought you were maybe chewing on something well they all seem to be shuffling around a bit uh, they're going to have to move, though, as soon as the clouds break. If they do break and the sun comes through, uh, they're going to have to go and find some decent shade because they haven't really got any big trees to lay under. They might have to do what the other pride has done and move sort of further to the left of me where there is a massive lugger and then a sort of quite dense with lots and lots of trees. That would be a very good spot. Keep out of the wind, keep out of the sun. Also hide away from the prey. And then they'll have a good chance of catch something, catching something tonight. But I do think that that is the Angama prides that have just gone on a walkabout and perhaps they're all scattered out. But we'll continue with this investigation um, this afternoon. So remember to join us, of course, for the, the Sunset Safari. They will all be out and, and I think it's going to be a lion-filled day. And perhaps Tristan in the Sabi Sand will bring you some leopards. Until then, we'll see you soon. Thank you.